I don't know if you read this book or maybe heard a TED talk by a, she was a designer, she was an author, she's a architect, she's an urban planner, and her name is Candy Chang. And she wrote a book called Before I Die. And the essence of this book came because she was walking in New Orleans one day and walking down the block and saw uh, a large abandoned building. And she looked at this building again as maybe an urban planner, an architect, a designer, and said, well, what can I do to make this building, make my neighborhood a nicer place to live? And so she, uh, in fact, this is being, she's saying this through a TED talk, uh, about how her book came to fruition. And then she also thought, as she's kind of walking through this neighborhood and saying, how can I make it a nicer place? She also thought about something that changed her life forever. You see, in 2009, she said she lost someone very special to her. She went through death, a, a time of deep pain and agony and sorrow. And she said that her, her death was sudden and unexpected. And, uh, and she thought about death a lot. And this made her feel deep gratitude for the time that she had and brought clarity to the things that are meaningful in her life. But she went on to say, I struggle to maintain this perspective in my daily life. And maybe we're all like that. She, though we, we encounter death and, and we have that time where we're kind of self-reflective, but she went on to say, like all of us and many of you, she struggled to maintain that deep clarity in that meaning throughout her daily life, three months, six months, a year later. She said, I feel like it's easy to get caught up in day-to-day -day living and forget what really matters to you. And so she built relationships with her town and with her neighborhood and went through all these sort of uh, conversations with people. Again, more communication, more conversation, uh, the importance of all that. And she turned the eyesore that she called it into a work of art. She covered one side of the house with chalkboard paint and she stenciled uh, a few words, uh, a couple of five, six words and, and, and said, uh, and approximately 80 times its size. So, you know, imagine this large house, maybe from that end to that end, with huge word stencils inside of it. Before I die, I want to blank. She got a bucket, put some chalkboard, chalk near the wall. And she goes on to say that before it was finished, that someone who uh, was in a pirate costume and she, and she joked in her TED talk, she said, well, it's New Orleans. Of course people walk around in pirate costumes. <laughs> and, and she said, this person came to her in the pirate costume and says, is it okay if I write on this wall? And she thought for a minute, she said, of course. And so he wrote, before I die, I want to be charged for piracy. <laughs> And, and, and it goes on that, that, that people uh, time and time again begin to get this chalk from this bucket and begin to write things on this wall, some funny, some hysterical, some offering deep meaning to it. And she said in her TED Talk, she read these things, before I die, I want to straddle the international dateline. Before I die, I want to sing for millions. Before I die, I want to plant a tree. I want, before I die, I want my children to know the importance of giving. Before I die, I want to hold her one more time. Before I die, I want to be completely myself. Before I die, I want to live outside of this facade that I have. Before I die, I want to be the change. You see, my sisters and brothers in Christ, and what uh, the interviewer went on and she had a conversation with others, what this before I die wall became was not an opportunity to reflect, uh, not the, uh, an opportunity to make think, people think about death as much, but it became an opportunity for people to think about life, about living. And that's what Paul wanted to uh, exude in this letter to the Philippians. He wrote this letter in prison. He was, uh, they didn't use that time, this, this uh, 
this phrase at that time, but he was charged with the death penalty. He was on death row as he sat in this Philippians prison about to embark on his own death. He wrote this letter to the Philippian church uh, and we get those common phrases, rejoice. I say it again, rejoice that in the midst of all that's going on through prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God with thanksgiving. He wrote this awesome letter of encouragement for all to hear, to say that in the midst of death, in the midst of the heartache, in the midst of the pain, continue to live, continue to find ways to strengthen your joy. In the midst of death, he thought about living, about life, and he wanted those who heard some of his final words here on this earth to also think about what Candy Chang said, what really matters in life. In fact, he then quotes this common hymn, and this is, so, so a lot of y'all know I like singing, and I think this is an important uh, piece just to uplift the hymns, because chap Philippians chapter two, verses five through 11, uh, was, it's called the Christological hymn. It was, many think that it was something that was circulating in the early church well before the gospels and other parts of the Bible were actually written down. And they used these words uh, to teach uh, the essence of faith. And so I know that we love our contemporary music and that we like, uh, many people say contemporary music is just the same uh, 11 words repeated seven times over and over again. And, and that uh, those who are proponents of our hymns would say the good hymns are, are a place of our theology and they teach us what it, it means to be people of faith. Well, I would agree. That what we see in this hymn, uh, uh, what we see in this hymn is an essence of our faith. It teaches us who Christ was. It talks about the incarnation. It talks about the atonement. It talks about having the same mind as that of Jesus the Christ. That's what these opening words of this hymn are to remind us of. Be of the same mind that was found in Christ. This is a call to living, a call to realize those aspects, aspects of life that matter the most. And it's why throughout this Lenten season, I've asked you several questions. You know, what do you want to grow? That before I die, you might answer that question. I want kindness to exude all aspects of my living. Before I die, you might ask the question, I want self-discipline to be the hallmark of my progress. Before I die, <laughs> no matter what they do, I want patience with my children. Can I get an amen? <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or maybe not your children, but maybe your grandchildren, or maybe other people's kids as you're riding on the airplane and they're crying and you just want patience to overcome. Before I die, I want to grow the fruit of the Spirit. And I want the fruit of the Spirit, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, joy, peace, love, patience, to be the answers to that question, what do I want to grow? And I want it to be in every aspect of my life. I want it to be as a father, as a husband. I want it to be as a neighbor, as a friend, I want it to be as a pastor, as a citizen. What do you want to grow? And, and look, we, these answers, this, this uh, love, joy, peace, patient, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, there is no law against these as the scriptures say. And so I say, why not let these be the answers to the question, what do you want to grow? And we come to these answers in part because we have a growing understanding of that other question that I've asked you throughout this Lenten season. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to us? I've asked you to reflect on this question each week because this question moves you to living as one who is prepared to die. One who has the same mind as that of Jesus the Christ. Do me a favor, open up your hymnals for me and turn to page 871.
You see on page 870 the title, A Service of Death and Resurrection. And then looking over to page 871, a prayer that we may commonly pray at a funeral service, at a worship service. O oh God who gave us birth, you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray. And then skipping down to that sentence that begins, speak to us once more your solemn message of life and of death. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die. And when our days here are accomplished, enable us to die as those who go forth to live. So that whether we live or whether we die, our life, our living, who we are may be in you. And that nothing in life or in death will be able to separate us from the great love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You can close your hymnals and put them back. This is the essence, this prayer, these thoughts are the essence of our theme throughout Lent, preparing to sow miracles. It's a recognition that each day we wake up, it's an opportunity to go forth to live, knowing that this day may be our last. So the conversation, the plans, the actions, the discipline, the corrections, the truth that we speak are all actions we do within and outside of our household can all be seeds of hope and love that we plant in the lives of others we interact with. Candy Chang, this author, this designer, this one who wrote Before I Die, she went on to say, people focused on think that as a result of this statement, before I die, and people reflecting on that, it allowed her and others to focus on things that in life that really matter. You see, contemplating death really clarifies our life and it's a powerful tool to restore perspective and remember the things that make life meaningful. Dr. Derek Nelson died last Sunday and I was speaking with some members of in the school district and one in particular and she said you know Reverend whenever something like this happens I'm always reminded of the fragility of death and how important life is and the importance of living now uh, the importance of saying what we need to say now but she says it strikes me that Death, someone's death has to remind me, jolt me back into this remembrance. And why is it that death has to make us remember all that is important in life now? I didn't have an answer. But we left that conversation saying we, we committed to each other, accountability partners with each other, that we will take opportunities to live life now to say our thank yous. You, you saw last week I said uh, uh, when uh, uh, Mary was anointing the feet of Jesus that it was important to establish and say our thank yous now that death was in the air. My brothers and sisters, it's an important piece to look around. Life is not promised. But what is promised is an opportunity to live life to the fullest. It may sound cliche, but for you, for the things that are going on in your life, I pray that it's an opportunity for you to, to remember and to realize and to come to an understanding of what really matters the most. Maybe some of the arguments that you're in Eh, it's not that important. Maybe that grudge you were holding on to, like, uh, it's not important. Maybe the silence that you have needs to let, be let go and speak the truth of who you are. Living as one who's prepared to die. 
having the same mind of Jesus the Christ. They're one and the same. Jesus was humility and obedient to, throughout his life. This time of Lent, as we focus on the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, may our two questions, what do you want to grow? And who is Jesus to you? Help you live as someone who's prepared to die. Amen.